Today's reading is from the Reverend a Dr. A. Powell Davies. Davies was a minister of All Souls Unitarian Church in Washington, D.C. in the 1940s and 50s. He has this to say, we grow by fellowship. The life of our minds and the joy of our hearts is very, very largely the gift of others. We long to share our lives with other people, to understand on other minds, to be ourselves understood. Such fellowship, such communion is life itself. If we are denied it, we become dwarfed and wizened, shrunken and distorted, spiritual starvelings. So closely are we intertwined with other lives, indeed with all life, all the life of all the world, that all gain and all loss anywhere, all advance or all disaster everywhere, intimately affects us. As John Donne told us, no man is an island entire of itself. No, we are what we are because of the human world in which we live, a world of manifold relationships. And because of our intimates, our close companions, our friends. It is therefore obvious that we grow by fellowship, by relationship to other people, by not being alone. Before I embark on my talk, I just want to extend greetings from my partner, Ralph, who was a loyal member of the Half Hour Choir during our year here. Um, and I just say that I'm thrilled to be back, and I'm going to talk more about that here. So I haven't had a chance to say hi. But that's my hi. So throughout history, congregations of all sizes and persuasions have worked hard to give the impression of permanence. From the temples of millennia past to the sturdy stone churches of more modern times, there's an architectural striving for a sense of the eternal. And if you happen to find yourself gazing upward inside the Pantheon in Rome or touring that cathedral closer to home in St. Paul, it can be hard to imagine a time before such a place existed and harder still to imagine a time when it will be gone. The whole point is to get you to think about and feel a connection to the idea of forever. But for many Unitarian Universalist congregations, the reality of place is much more fluid. We UUs of today are descended from religious traditions that were quite mobile. Traditions that grew up in a country that it is itself almost defined by its movement from one location to another. The reality of our congregational portability really came to my awareness during a UU history class I took in seminary. We had a wonderful professor who not only taught us about the macro sweep of Unitarian Universalism, but she also wanted to hear from us, us students, to get more of the micro perspectives. So my classmates and I each had to prepare a presentation on the history of our home congregations. For me, this turned out to be an incredibly easy assignment. I felt like I was cheating because my home church, the First Universalist Church of Minneapolis, had just turned 150 years old, and members of the church had put together an entire book about the history. <laughs> but similar to many others, that congregation had at least three major location, relocations during its history. At one point, it moved more than five miles across town in Minneapolis to a new home. In the stories shared by my classmates who weren't from New England, where the churches never move, it was pretty much standard that their congregations moved at least once. And if I'm remembering correctly, every one of our churches burned down at least once. My home congregation actually basically burned down twice. Once while the Universalists owned it, and shortly after they sold it to the Catholics, it burned down again. <laughs> Most of these fires were before the flaming chalice became our symbol, so I do not think we can blame, you know, inattentive worship leaders for this trend. It was just a fairly common thing that happened. And fire regularly required congregations to take stock of their spaces and to think about what kinds of things they truly needed to be who they wanted to be. I don't know if you know this, but Unity Church in St. Paul, where I served my internship, has a skylight because of their fire. They used the hole in the roof to let sunlight into their sanctuary in the mornings. A disaster does provide an immediate and unambiguous motivation for a church to relocate, at least temporarily. 
But in these days of modern sprinkler systems, a congregational move is less like to, likely to emerge from the smoke of a fire than from a flurry of important questions. Questions about who a congregation is, how it wants to conduct its worship and program, and whom it might, might want to attract and make room for. And this fellowship right here is familiar with such questions. It's not afraid to ask them and to see where they lead, metaphorically or geographically. As Carolyn mentioned earlier, I had the good fortune of serving this fellowship in 2013-2014. Shortly before I arrived, you all had been gathering in a meeting room at the library. Then, on my first Sunday with you, it was your first service at the community center across the river. And I believe my last Sunday with you nine months later was your last service at the community center, right as you were preparing to come here. I will say that for future reference, you don't actually have to relocate to get me to come visit. <laughs> I can stop by, I've got a little more free time now, so just, 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 just call. But it is a great honor to be a part of your story and to be with you to mark these milestones in the life of your delightfully adaptable congregation. Because I am a fairly organized person, this past week I was able to look through my digital and paper school files from back in the day. I found the reading that I used from my first Sunday service with you, and I liked it so much that it's the reading we just heard this morning. John Horwich actually read it at that first service. The author of that reading, the Reverend A. Powell Davies, was a powerhouse Unitarian minister in the 1940s and 50s. And he strongly believed, as you do, in the importance of congregations. He understood the meaningful role that they can play in individual lives and the difference they can make in the broader community. We long to share our lives with other people, to understand other minds, and to be ourselves understood, he wrote. Such fellowship, such communion is life itself. Davies spoke eloquently about what congregational communities meant to him, whether he was a, whether as a preacher or a congregant. In another of his pieces, a sermon called On Going to Church, he had this to say. I could easily despair. Doubt and dismay could overwhelm me. My church renews my courage and my hope. I need to re be reminded that there are things I must do in the world, unselfish things, things undertaken at the level of idealism. I must have my, con my conscience sharpened, sharpened until it goads me to the most thorough and responsible thinking of which I am capable. I must feel again the love I owe to others. I must not only hear about it, but feel it. In church, I do. A compelling speaker and a leader in civil rights, Davies was passionate about the value of congregations. So when his own church in the heart of Washington, D.C. filled beyond capacity in the 1950s, he started five more congregations in the suburban areas around the city. Today, those five congregations provide a spiritual home to nearly 1,800 UUs. Davies believed in bringing congregations to where people lived. And that's exactly what SCOOF has done and has been doing and will continue to do, working to fill a need in this area for more than 10 years. And places like SCOOF are perhaps as important as they have ever been. Maybe you've felt that heightened importance in your life. Maybe you've had a greater interest in finding a bit of refuge in community after a week of sobering national and international news. Maybe you long to be with like-hearted people after an uncomfortable conversation with a relative whose views differ from your own. Maybe you appreciate the reminder, as A. Powell Davies put it, that there are things you must do in the world, unselfish, idealistic things, and you appreciate having companions on that journey. Maybe it's the importance of having a place where you don't have to explain yourself or worry about being yourself perhaps as someone who believes in a woman's own bodily autonomy, or as someone who doesn't follow a traditional concept of God, or as someone who loves someone transgender. To understand other minds and to be ourselves understood. Places like this, places like Scoof, 
are so important as theocracy and authoritarianism and conspiracy theories continue to influence our politicians and our institutions and some of our neighbors. This fellowship is such a gift to this community and you are all a gift to each other. You really understand the significance of the work you're doing, the tending of each other's souls, supporting each other with care and with singing and with togetherness, standing up for causes that may not be very popular in this conservative landscape you live in. And because you understand the importance of this fellowship, when you found yourselves amid that flurry of questions about what's best for your congregation, you found your way to some answers. And I'm just guessing here, but you may have had to work through some variations in opinion, but you did it. You're moving to a new location, but you stayed together in the embrace of covenant. And you did all that amid the lingering effects of the pandemic, a pandemic that has dragged on and kept people apart and continues to make it more challenging to make connections. You did it. Still, all changes, even positive changes, come with challenges. Every change has losses and gains. Even for a covenantal group, change poses risks and unknowns. So how might we be? How might we keep our center in the face of such change? It's good to keep in mind that when we make a commitment to our movement or to a fellowship, we make that commitment not only across time, but across change because there is no time without change. Every denomination and every congregation, they're always changing, sometimes a little and sometimes dramatically. The individual members within them grow and age, and everyone who comes or goes changes the group at least a little bit by their presence or absence. When I think about making a commitment to an institution across time and change, I'm reminded of a personal relationship I have, one that has taught me a lot about how to be and how to love when things don't stay the same. Uh, my partner Ralph and I have no children of our own and only one niece. And so this one niece gets a lot of our attention, whether she likes it or not. Her name is Elizabeth and though she is a teenager now, I remember very clearly a moment of realization I had back when she was six years old. When she and her parents came to visit that summer, it was the first time I'd ever played host to a six-year-old. On the previous visit, she had been a five-year-old, and the time before that, she was just three, so we were in new territory. And so when she and her parents were there with us, I took us all to the same playground that we had gone to on one of their earlier visits. But once we were there, I soon realized that most of the climbing areas in that particular playground were designed for preschoolers kids younger than my niece now was. My ever-changing niece at the ripe old age of six had outgrown that playground. While I had very much enjoyed being her uncle during her preschooler days, I came to the realization that I couldn't hold tightly to those experiences. I could cherish them and remember them, but I couldn't hold on to them forever. That trip to the playground helped me realize that I needed to not only accept and cherish the past, but celebrate all that was new. There were things Elizabeth could do as a six-year-old that she couldn't do when she was three or four or even five. There were new things I could teach her now that she was a year more intelligent and a year more mature. And of course, as you may know, if you have watched a child grow up, in the years since then, there have been numerous rounds of losses and gains as time has marched my niece toward adulthood. The playgrounds were left behind a long time ago, but there's so much more that she can do now. As her uncle, I've made a commitment across time and a commitment across change. My commitment puts my individual wishes and grievings in the context of the larger changes. It puts them in the context of past, present, and future and I remain steadfast in my love. I have a second story I'd like to share about my niece, a story that illustrates why change within our congregations and within Unitarian Universalism is necessary in an ever-changing world. So please forgive me for offering one more cute kid story about my ever smart, active, and curious niece. 
One year around Christmas time at a big family gathering, all the little kids received the same gift from one of my dad's cousins. The gift was a nativity scene, a miniature creche. My niece was a first grader at the time, and while she was raised in a small town, we did not think of her as particularly sheltered. She had traveled thousands of miles with her family. She had watched a lot of educational television, and she was very handy with technology. But when my niece was given that manger scene, she had no idea what it was. She had no idea who the baby was. She had been living on this earth for nearly seven years, immersed in what we sometimes think of as our Judeo-Christian culture. But like an ever-increasing number of Americans, she had never been inside a church, and she had zero awareness of Jesus. To try to bring Elizabeth up to speed, my sister provided her with a short version of the biblical Christmas story. <laughs> my niece listened to this and was satisfied. Pretty sure they didn't go into virgin birth or any of that stuff. Just, you know, <laughs> the manger, the star, that stuff. Okay. My niece was satisfied and she continued to play with what she called her Jesus family. She volunteered that she liked Jesus because that's why we have Christmas. It's a holiday that she loves and one that she has to this day continued to think of in entirely non-religious terms. This is probably pretty different from the culture that most of us grew up in. But a life without church is more and more the norm for telling tens of millions of people in this country. For many of them, congregations are neither essential nor a source of great pain. They might be something rarely thought of at all. The rising tide of the never religious poses both challenges and opportunities for Unitarian Universalists. It poses challenges and opportunities for fellowships like this one. How do you get people in the door on a Sunday morning when they've never had the habit? How might we adjust what we do to lure them in? Even with all that is constantly changing in the world, I believe there is still a role for progressive congregations because people are still people. They still face the big questions of human existence. They still search for wisdom and meaning, and they still yearn for connection and community. So we UUs at congregations of all sizes must be steadfast in believing that we can be a gift in more people's lives. And so, you, uh, so here you are, closing this chapter at the Edling Building and getting ready to turn the page. Making the kind of move that's been so common in the history of successful UU congregations. Congregations that do what needs to be done to meet the needs of the moment and the needs of the long term doing what needs to be done to continue to welcome those who have been long committed and to make space literally and figuratively for those who might join you and become a part of your story. Such fellowship, such communion is life itself. Congratulations as you move forward together.